loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commands, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay, lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves. Um, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have, I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go, I appointed you, sorry. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the father will give, what, give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love one another. I, I wonder um, what comes to your mind um, when you think about that word obedience. Um, just have a, just want to give you a minute just to kind of think of what's the first few things that kind of come to mind. Because um, from that passage that Alethea read to us, I don't know if you've ever wondered about it, but um, what in the world does Jesus mean by saying, if you love me, you'll obey my commands? I wonder if you've ever read that and thought, hold on, wait a minute, because I love you, I have to do what you say? It's compulsory? I thought my faith was about freedom about grace, and yet you're saying that if I'm serious about loving you, I have to do what you say. There seems to be a bit of a paradox here, doesn't there? What we find in scripture is that God loves you, God loves us, no matter what we've done or what we will do. God could not love us more and he will not love us less. And yet there are these passages in the Bible that, that say what you do, it does matter. And if you love God, you will live this way. We need to hold these two things in balance, don't we? Because if we don't, either we become grace abusers who um, use this grace that we've received as a license to do whatever we feel like. Or on the other hand, we end up so driven to do the right thing um, that we become legalistic and our faith diminishes into a bunch of rules. This is this tension of grace and obedience. So obedience is kind of a funny word, isn't it? I don't know what you thought of when I first said it, but sometimes saying it, just saying it can make us a bit uncomfortable. It has kind of negative connotations for a lot of people. Um, it can make us think of authoritarian dictatorships where obedience is demanded and enforced. We could kind of get these images of tyrannical leaders or perhaps um, overbearing parents or abusive partners Obedience carries with it this notion that obeying can lead to oppression. Even if the connotations that you have <laughs> with the word obedience aren't that extreme, there's still a reason why um, the obey in the love, honour, obey in the um, traditional wedding ceremonies has been dropped so often recently. Women don't want to say that they'll obey their husbands. Why not? There's something about obedience that irks us a little bit. It challenges our right to make our own decisions, to be the one in control. Even if you don't think of dictatorships, your impression of that word obedience, is not necessarily positive. And so generally speaking, we're not really into obedience, are we? We're into rebellion. Particularly here in Australia, we champion the underdog. We're on the side of the team that's losing. Um, we like rebellion a little bit and we mistake our rebellion for freedom. But I want to suggest to you this morning that obedience is not about oppression and freedom is not about rebellion. I want to suggest to you this morning that obedience is the response to grace and obedience is the fruit of trust. When I was much younger, um, the church that I was a part of used to sing a hymn, and I'm not sure whether it's one that you know, but um, it goes a bit like this. I won't sing for you, but um, it goes, um, trust and obey, for there's no other way 
to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Do you know that one? A couple of nods? Yeah. Obedience and trust go together. Obedience is a choice. Obedience is really about willing submission, not authoritarian dictatorship. Obedience describes the action of the one who submits. And it's a choice. We choose to submit to those that we trust. The best example I can think of for this is parents and children. Kids don't always see the big picture. And sometimes parents just have to say no or stop. And kids generally <laughs> trust their parents to choose well for them. Well, while they're little anyway. And then you know, maybe that changes. Another, another example, maybe a different example, is the coach of a sporting team. And the coach tells a player to do something. Um, they do it. They trust that the coach can see the bigger picture and has the best interest of the team at heart. So when we think about obedience, it's a choice, but it's also about who we are obeying. There's a difference between being obedient to a tyrannical dictator and being obedient to one who has your best interests at heart. I wanted to start with this this morning because I want us to think about these words of Jesus and this framework around obedience as we come to the passage that we're focusing on today. Today we come to this um, last message in our series in Deuteronomy. If you've been joining us um, here or um, on the podcast or online, um, we've been walking through these final words that Moses speaks to the people, um, the Israelites, before they cross the Jordan River. And Moses has a series of things that he wants to say to the people. Um, some kind of, as you go, just don't forget, don't forget these things. And so far, Moses has reminded and set out for the people kind of a history of how they've become a nation. He said, remember who you are. Remember where you come from. He's reminded them of their relationship with God, to remember who God is, to remember that God is faithful and merciful and that he can be trusted. But also remember that God is God and you are not. To live in the land, God requires certain things of you as his people. And these things are laid out in commands and statutes and requirements and ordinances. And these will be the guiding laws for your community. And these, all of these things Moses says to the people in order to build a community of people, a community that is set apart and distinguished by how their God calls them to live. And then what we get to today, this is the last of our series, Moses gets to his wrap-up, his final words in this series of Don't Forget To's that we get to this morning. And he calls the people to choose the things that will lead to life. He says, obedience will lead to life. This is what we find in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3. In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses, the ones that David spoke about last week, that I've listed for you, and when you're living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul, all the commands that I've given you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from the nations where he has scattered you. There's just a couple of things here that I think are worth noting. First, Moses says, when. When you experience these blessings and curses, when you are living in exile, not if, but when. And the second thing is that when these things happen, Moses' advice is to return to God and obey these commands with all your heart and with all your soul. God was speaking with Moses to the people in order to build this godly community. Now, the people failed to be that community. We know that from reading the rest of the Old Testament. But here, it seems that Moses knows this too. He's been walking with this group of people for a generation. He's interceded on their behalf with God. And he knows himself as well. And what we see as we read through this is that um, Deuteronomy sets out an ideal of a community and then it develops this teaching around reality. There's kind of these two things always playing off to, against each other. 
we see that while the law exists to carve out and set an image of the ideal God-honouring community, Moses knows the people will fall short. And Moses, in love, wants to prepare them for that. When you fall short, when you get sent into exile, they haven't even entered the land yet, but when you, when you have to leave, when God sends you out and scatters you, here is what you do. You return to God. You obey his commands with all your heart and soul and know that God will have mercy on you and gather you back. I just think it's worth us reflecting on this. God is at work through Moses to cultivate this community marked by grace that reflects the goodness of God to those around them. This kind of community doesn't just happen because there are guidelines. Just because the law is there, that doesn't make a community. The guidelines help, but learning something takes practice. It actually takes making mistakes. And in the learning, it isn't learning to follow guidelines that the people are trying to learn, but they're learning to become the kind of people who would voluntarily choose to live out those guidelines. But it becomes part of who they are from their inside out. Obey his commands with all your heart and with all your soul. God is still in the business of creating and cultivating a community marked by grace. This church, our community, it's called to be a group of people who live out our faith in such a way as to bless those around us and to honour God. And we make mistakes. We know that. We don't always get this right. We mess it up. And so some of these words, they're for us too. And so as we come to these last words that Moses speaks to the people in Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 20, it goes a bit like this. No, it doesn't go a bit like this. It goes like this. Um, this command I'm giving you today is not too difficult for you and it is not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so that we can hear it and obey? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, who will cross the sea and bring it so that we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. Now listen, today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands and decrees and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will receive life and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you and the land you're about to enter and occupy. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and if you're drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long, good life in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And after he says this, Moses um, commissions Joshua to be the new leader. He sings a song because that's important. He blesses Israel and then God takes him to the top of the mountain so he can see the land that he will never enter and then he dies and that's the end of Deuteronomy. Um, it's a happy ending, isn't it? Um, this is where Deuteronomy concludes and so this is actually the final, final words of Moses that he has for these people, for the people that he's speaking to. The first thing he says to them is that these commands are not beyond your reach. It is not too difficult for you. All of the things that he's been saying, they're actually not too hard. So, yes, they, like us all, will mess it up. They will make mistakes. But living out love and obedience to God is not beyond them. It's not impossible. And this is also important for us to know because sometimes, especially when we come to these passages in the Old Testament, 
it can feel like God is there with like a clipboard and a pen kind of waiting for the people to mess up so that he can like tick off the, I'm going to do all of these horrible things to you. That's not the intention. Life with God is not too difficult for the people and it's not too difficult for us. It's not beyond us. The second thing is that Moses lays out this choice for the people. You get to choose now. You're about to walk into the land. You get to choose now how you will live. One way of living leads to life and the other leads to death. And he begs the people, choose life. Now, of course, you know, they and we would all say, I, of course I choose life. Like you giving me that choice if the option is life or death, of course I choose life. But how did, how did they know and how do we know that we actually are choosing life? That that's not just something we want, but it's actually something we're doing. Over the last few weeks, um, David has explored with us that in Deuteronomy, Moses exhorts the people to choose well. He reminds them that their choices have consequences and that this is also, and this is also at the heart of Moses' words here. Choosing well is a theme in Deuteronomy. And today we want to spend some time not just thinking about how important it is to choose well as God's people and not just the impact on us personally or collectively when we don't choose well. Um, but what does it look like for us to become people who choose well, who live life well every day? How do we actually do that? Moses says to the people here in Deuteronomy, you don't need someone from across the seas to come and tell you whether you're doing well. You love the Lord, your God, by walking in his ways. That is, you immerse yourself in God's word, in God's commands. And as you sit with those things, they infuse into your spirit. They will, they will then become more and more the things that you naturally choose. In John 14, we find these words of Jesus that he spoke to his disciples. In John 14, verses 15 to 21, um, we find this. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, one who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognise him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in, the, in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. The more that we know and choose to do life day to day with God, the more we become a person whose thoughts are aligned to God's ways. And for us to do life well, that's good for us, but it's also good for the people who are around us. It's good for our communities and it's good for the world more broadly. This is why God is interested in creating a community that will grow people like this. This is why God is interested in who you are becoming, not just what you do, but how you choose those things. Now, for Israel, in the end, they didn't choose life. It wasn't a one-off choice. It was about every day, and again and again, they chose poorly. And that's not different to us. Choosing life for us is not a, a once-off decision. It's about the way we live. It's about all of the things that we choose, how we look, what we say, what we buy, how we spend our time. We choose all of those things. They are our choices. We are free to choose in that space. But the choices that we make define us. That might seem a bit intense, particularly for a Sunday morning, but just as the Israelites would be defined by the way they live their lives. So are we. Let me give you an example to make it a bit more concrete. If you choose to respond to someone in anger, um, 
when you do that once, you're more likely to respond that way again. And the more you choose that response, the more you actually become an angry person. And the opposite is also true. When you choose to respond to someone in compassion, you, you are likely to choose that response again and again, even though it's hard, which brings you and creates and builds you into becoming a more compassionate person. Here's the good news. So as we make choices, God is training us to become the person that he wants us to be. He's not sitting there with a clipboard and a pen marking off all the things that we do wrong. He's that coach saying, hey, you can't necessarily see the big picture, but I want you to do this. It's going to make a difference. God gave the Israelites the law not so that they had a textbook to follow because it isn't. We know that the Bible doesn't cover every situation and tell you what to choose. He gave the Israelites the law as an expression of relationship. He gave it to them in order to create a people, to create a godly community. And God is still on about relationship. That hasn't changed. God is interested in you becoming more like Jesus. God is interested in us choosing well, in choosing the things that lead to life in Christ. God is interested in us doing life well. So for us, we need to train our minds and our hearts to choose well, which takes practice, which means that we sometimes will get it wrong. But we're making decisions in light of the things that we know and learn on our spiritual work, this walk, sorry. That's how we know that we're growing. That's how we know that we're choosing life. Are we thinking about what God would do, what God would have us do in certain situations? And if we don't know, are we praying about those things? Are we checking with other people who um, know God well? Are we asking other people, hey, what would you do in this situation? I don't know if I got it right or wrong. As we are moving in our lives, as we are stepping forward, we need to learn what decisions lead to life. Learning to choose well does mean that we are going to make mistakes at times. But at the moment, when you think about the choices that you have to make this week, some of them might be really big decisions, some of them might be very small. But are they choices that are leading to you becoming a more loving person, more patient, more generous, more just, more gracious? Are the decisions that you make shaping you to become more the person that God wants you to be? I just want to um, leave you with some few questions just to um, reflect on and respond to. Um, so just to, we're going to take some time, we'll play some music in a moment, but if you're wanting to um, actually respond, you can um, send a chat through to Northern Community or you can send a text um, to the number there on the screen or send an email to myresponse at nccc.org.au. Um, so this week, um, what does it look like for you to obey his commands with all your heart, with all your soul? What might that look like in practice for you? What decisions are you facing at the moment and how might God be using those choices to train you to become more like Jesus? Yeah. And then um, take some time to pray in response to God's um, gift of life and freedom and ask God to help you choose life in all that you do and say this week. We're just going to take some time to pray um, and then we'll um, end reflecting that space and then we'll um, come back together. Thanks, Olivia.